Ladies and gentlemen, Adam Neely. Wow, man, amazing. You just improvising that, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I call that noodling around in E minor. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, hey guys, welcome to the vlog. Um, yeah, very, very fortunate to have Adam with us today. Um, anyone, any of you guys that don't know Adam's channel, go and check it out. It is amazing. Um, so what, what I'm talking to people about at the moment, I'm on this journey of learning. And I'm finding it challenging, mm. right? Um, I've got, I've been using the same knowledge basically for the last 10 years. I haven't really pushed myself. And I've got to the point, I'm like, okay, I'm now ready to move forward. And I, like a lot of guitar players, tend to f fixate on things and disappear down rabbit holes with certain things. But one thing I love about your approach to music, it's almost this holistic thing it, you, um, Yes, you're a bass player, but you, uh, the music that you play and that you're involved with, the, the range is so massive. Um, and it seems that you just, you have a real great handle on um, like getting the most out of, you know, being involved in, in music. Um, so, yeah, I, I just, what I'm really interested in is how, you know, breaking out of this box and sort of moving forward with, understanding of music and being able to apply it and mm. you know um yeah yeah well i had a, a teacher this this is kind of like the thing that i've always thought about i had a teacher said an artist's job is not to ask the question may i is to ask the question what if so wow. uh, approaching anything that you're learning there should never be the thought that like well should i be doing this like right. is this right is this like the right thing to do what's like the right answer it's well what if this happened and i've really taken that to heart because that's the way that i practice scales it's the way that i practice chord progressions it's the way i practice pretty much everything and that's kind of how i've done it um you know in the beginning when you're learning like say a c major scale mm -hmm. you're told okay well i'm going to play it like you might have a teacher who shows you that shape like mm -hmm. i'm going to play the c major scale up like that but one of the things that one of my teachers really, um, my, my upright bass teacher in, in high school, he really kind of like changed the way I thought about things. It was, he would play something and then I would play it back. And then, then he would think, well, you could also play it this way. And then I would play it back. And well, you could also play it this way. And I would play it back. And it was always this back and forth. But I saw him, his name is Pepe Gonzalez. I saw him always coming up with new ideas. Like, well, this is another way of doing it. This is not the best way of doing it. This is just another way of doing it. Mm. And so I then started thinking, well, you know, how many different ways could I play this C major scale? Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, I could play it maybe all on one string. Yep. Maybe I could play it like alternating, uh, I'm just making it up right yeah, now, yeah, yeah. alternating the A string and the E string. So like. It's not a very practical way of playing <laughs> sure. this scale. But because I was doing it that way, I was engaging my, engaging my thought. I was like, really, okay, well, how would I do this? Right. Who cares if it's the right way or not? Sure. How would I do this? And when you're always thinking of new ways of doing something, it's a very freeing thing because you're never like, you're never, um, you're never caught in that like mindset of like, well, is, is this the right thing to be doing right mm. now? It's like, what could I be doing next? Mm. So that's kind of like what I, I've always been preaching to people who like are having a hard time sometimes um, like learning a lot of theory immediately on their instrument mm -hmm. is it's asking the question, what if, like, what, what if I did something? That's right, why. right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so one thing that uh, I'm sure there's a lot of guys like myself who've got to a certain level of playing guitar and so I can play and, you know, I love chords and, you know, extended harmony all that sort of stuff but moving on from there what tends to happen is because i've been playing this way for so long and i'm i'm competent at yeah, it, yeah but as soon as i start to branch out it starts i start making mistakes yeah, yeah. and you know it's just things that don't sound great which is we, it's a hard thing to wrap your head around trying to while you're trying to improve and sound better it feels like you've got to take steps back. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So what's, you know, is this just a thing to get over and... Yeah, well, 
so I learned how to read music a little later on in the game. I could play I could play bass pretty well. Right. And then when you learn how to read music after not, you know, learning that way, it's you start from the beginning. Yeah, right. You start from the very beginning, and it's absolutely frustrating. Um, but yeah, it, it for me at least in that that moment, it was something I kind of just had to get over, which was I'm gonna suck right now. Right. I'm gonna suck bad. <laughs> And that was that was very hard because your ego is so wrapped up in your ability That's to play really, well. Your identity is yes. is wrapped up in your ability to play well. Fascinating. And you know, this is just music. Yeah. This is not, you know, something. I mean, it, it's it is a huge and important thing, and it has a, such a powerful um, means of connecting people. But it's just music. It's okay mm -hmm. to let your ego go and just suck for a little bit. Right. Um, and that's something I've had to learn over and over and over again. I'm, you know, I'm a decent bass player, but I'm not the best bass player. I'd like to be the better bass player, and the only way of doing that is letting my ego go a little bit, so I can be okay with sucking. I think that's the. <laughs> yeah. That's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So. Okay. What about what about <laughs> live performance? Mm -hmm. You're talking about the whole what if thing. How comfortable are you? Taking those chances mm -hmm. live. We're live right now. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So <laughs> quick string breakage, quick guitar change, uh, seamless. <laughs> it's, I mean, for me, it's always a trick. There's always a push and pull because no great art was created from playing it safe. But at the same time, it, by not playing it safe, you're guaranteed to fall on your face a few times. Right. And, you know, whenever you're improvising, whenever you're making something up on the spot, mm -hmm. for me, what that is is you're you're taking vocabulary you've already practiced yep. and you're trying to string it together. And the danger, of course, and the thrill of it mm. is stringing together things that you haven't played explicitly in that order before. Right. Um, so, you know, I go for it all the time and I fall on my face all the time. But the more that you go for it, the more comfortable you are with, with going for it. A lot, of, a lot of it for me is like um, knowing where to land. In other words, like... I know I'm gonna be playing like this simple riff that I've been playing, yep. like uh, So I know when I'm playing that sort of thing, I'm just like simple binder pentatonic lick. But I'm always very conscious of how I'm going to end up. Like I have a game plan along the way. Right. So that that really helps at, at least with the feeling of like, um, like not knowing where you're going, or like sure. the feeling of like pushing yourself. It's like I know where I'm ending up. I'm ending up on that beat one. Okay. So I could. <laughs> thinking like okay well i know where i'm ending up right. i don't know what any of this other stuff is this okay. is just nonsense but eventually there might be something that's kind of fun within all that nonsense right um that's that's kind of my my thought process is like charting charting where you end up and sure. then how you get there kind of doesn't matter <laughs> and, and doing a and if you're doing a like a solo mm -hmm. will you create those uh, like a little motif or something that you will reference back to in a similar sort of vein yeah you know to give you some way to go yeah, I mean, your audience needs to know where you are. Okay. Um, and that is like a, a landmark for yourself and the audience. But honestly, more for me, it's that it's a landmark for me to know, okay, I'm going to end up on beat one here, beat one here. And I'm a bass player, so that's more, more of my framework rather than if I'm playing more melodically with a solo or something like that. Um, I had another teacher say that you should always know exactly when to close the door. Like, okay. close the door on that idea, and slam, we're in. And I feel like that's the mark of somebody who, um, if they're not comfortable with it, they're not comfortable slamming the door on right. the idea. Right. Um, in my experience, anyway. Sure. Uh, for me, I can only speak to my, my, my experience. I, I don't feel like I've slammed the door sometimes. Sure. Then, I felt like I was slamming the door coming back to here. Yeah, right. So, um, yeah, that's that's... I guess that's my thought process. I'm like pushing myself live. Is mm. have a fr have a frame of reference to come back to. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about classical music for a second. Oh, okay. 
Um, <laughs> and now the reason. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> the reason I want to ask you about this is because your your classical knowledge is awesome. Thank right? you. And I think as guitar players, we sort of put ourselves in these boxes. There's a sort of solo music that we listen to, and most of us don't listen to. I say most of us. That's not, not quite fair, but um, you know we're hard stretched, focusing on other instruments. You know, getting out of the box, let alone focusing on other instruments. Whereas your classical study, is that a massive part of what's put you where you are today as far as your, you know, your, your jazz work and all that sort of stuff? How much has the classical informed that side of things? Um, a lot. I mean, my background is I studied classical piano for five or six years before right. moving on to the bass and studied jazz bass. I got my you know, degrees in jazz bass. Um, everything informs everything else, which sure. is one of the things that I find like most exciting is, you know, at the end of the day, the more that you learn about music, the more that you realize that everything is basically the same. We're all at least, I mean, I'm going to bite my words with that, but <laughs> there's a lot of similarities between music. Uh, we mostly use the same 12 notes. We right. mostly use the same kinds of rhythms. We mostly use the same general tonal system where there's like a tonic, a root note. Um, and there are differences, of course, but it, everything is, informs everything else. And I feel like the more that you're acquainted with a style of music on its own terms, mm. the more you're willing to uh, learn about other styles of music on their own terms. And what I mean by that is, is um, you can't really use classical theory to analyze a blues. I mean, you can. Right. It's right. like, well, this is the one chord, the four chord. There's so much more to it, though, than that. The mm. inflections, the tonal characteristics of the instruments. These are things that aren't necessarily talked about in classical theory. Sure. Whereas, you know, um, it wouldn't make sense to, I guess, bring too much of rock theory, as it were, into like the wo uh, world of like Mozart. Like you're not worried too much about guitar tone uh, when you're playing like symphony number no. four or whatever. That's not a big thing. So you approach each style on its own terms. Right. You understand the language of that style and mm -hmm. then you can relate it to other other things. And it's it's nice when you're approaching something open-minded because there's so much everything can teach you. Um, there's so much to learn. And you know, the more you learn, the more you realize that you don't know anything. Yeah, <laughs> Which is right. like, I think that's pretty cool. I think that's pretty freeing, yeah, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> okay, as, as, a, as a, you know, rock um, player, what is what's some some good classical music? If you if you've never considered opening up yourself to that side of things, mm -hmm. what's where can you start? Oh wow! Well, there's I mean there's so much, and I'm I'm not the classical guy by any stretch. Sure, sure. Um, I can tell you that one of my favorite pieces of music is Elgar's Cello Concerto, right. um, and specifically the cellist Jacqueline Dupre yes. playing it. Yeah, yeah. And I just love I love that because it's just it's impossible not to just like. Look, especially like if you look at a video of her performing, she's like super dynamic. She's yeah. really into it. And it's like, it's impossible not to look at that and like feel something. Yeah, right. Um, so that's, for me, that's a good place to start just because like, you're like, wow, this mm. is like such an emotive moment. But you know, there's many different kinds of styles of classical cool, music, cool. Baroque yeah, yeah. music. Yeah. And, um, you know, it really depends. I find that like rock musicians and shredders love the music of Bach because... It's, you know, lots, lots of scales moving every which way. It sounds good on guitar. Right. Like, it sounds good on bass. I love Bach because, you know, we're just playing the cello suite number one. Sorry. I'm just watching it. 
I've got tears. Me too. I've got tears in my eyes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> listening to you play that because it's so exactly what you just said. You can't fail but feel something. Oh, thank. You. That's when incredible. You play that. It's amazing. You know, this weird juxtaposition of all this. Uh, <laughs> You're cheering out there. But, wow, that's just absolutely beautiful. Thank you, man. Wow, man. Uh, well, I find, like, one of the nice things about practicing Bach, if you ever, anybody gets a chance to pick up some sheet music and work your way through, and it'll take a while, especially, sure. you know. Uh, Bach, um, it's impossible to not play it musically. Like, if I would just play that really slowly, and I was just practicing it for the first time. It's so simple, but it's like, it's so nice to play it. And he wrote this like 300 years ago. Uh, I, I don't know when the, uh, yeah, 300 That's years ago, yeah. Mad. Um, and it's, it's like a gift down from the centuries to us, which is like such a cool, such a cool thing. Yeah. What, what led you to want to be able to play like that on bass? Um, so there's a bass player by the name of Michael Manring, who, um, who I, I think he was the first person I heard play the Spock cello suite. And he did it a very interesting way. He tuned his bass C, G, D, A, which is like how a cello is tuned. Right, yep. So it's tuned in fifths. But then he put a capo in the 12th fret. So basically, if you tune it C, G, D, A, it's like a cello down an octave. Right. But then if you put it on the 12th fret, mm -hmm. it's basically you just turn your instrument kind a of a fretted cello a fretted cello yeah mm -hmm. and he and this and i've done that before um and the music almost makes a lot more sense when it's tuned like a cello versus wow. like a bass but i just learned how to do it this way like sort of this is a very guitaristic way of doing it right. um the bass player john patitucci plays it um closer to like where each note isn't sustained right and that there's a there's a art to that too. Um, there's a lot of other bass players who have who've done the first cello suite. And I, I heard it and I was like, this is super cool because it makes sense on bass too. Right. It's like this style of music, this idea um, really works for this instrument mm. in a way like, wow, this is super cool. I've learned a lot from that study of Bach. I've learned articulation, I've learned phrasing, and I can now apply that to basically anything that I, I do, which is I don't know. Super cool. That's it's a, super fun. Yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. Thank wow. You. Um, okay. I mean, I, I have so many more questions I'd like to ask, but, but uh, I think there's absolute <laughs> nuggets of gold in there. Um, thank you for yeah, everything yeah. that you do. I mean, you're, you're such an inspiring guy to, you know, to watch your journey and stuff. It's, it's amazing. Um, and thank you for hanging out with us. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for having me on. This was an honor for me, oh. too. <laughs> um, all right. Cheers, guys. Thanks so much for watching. Yeah. Massive thank you to uh, Tom and for having us here this week. They've been so good. Put us up in a really swanky hotel. Oh, man. It's been the best. Isn't it it's, great? It's great. <laughs> uh, till we see you again, thanks for watching, and we'll see you soon. Cheers, guys. Bye.